Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to our RSM in conversation. And uh, it's a, I mean, this is, this is a, a great uh, occasion for us. We're very happy about today because it's a great honor to welcome Kate Bingham, or as the Daily Mail called her, and I know you're going to hate this, the woman that saved Britain. Now, I don't know if you know, but Fortune magazine has an annual list of the 50 most powerful people in the world. And congratulations, Kate, you're at number 18. But before we get too big headed, I'm afraid you're still not the most uh, important person we've ever had because you're eclipsed by one of our previous guests in the conversation, Justin Welby, there at number 12. But um, no doubt when we see the next issue, I suspect those places will all have changed. So Kate, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Now, it just before and your, your life changed in many ways on May the 6th of last year when you took a call from Matt Hancock. But let's just start before that call and let's just kind of get a bit of a picture of what it is that you do for, the, for a living. Now, you're the managing partner of something called SV Health Investors, which is a venture capitalist firm. And um, first of all, what does SV stand for, by the way? Uh, it stands or stood for uh, Schroeder Ventures. Ah. So, um, uh, when we separated from Schroeder Ventures or Schroeder's at the time, instead of rebranding to come up with a completely new name, we were rather uncreative. And so we just stuck with, stuck with SV. Uh, and so we didn't end up paying any designers or branders. Oh. Like that. Oh, so that's I, I, how we've ended up there. I've heard something like Super Venture or something like that, but obviously not. Now, listen, explain to someone like me who generally doesn't move in that world, and a lot of our audience won't either, what exactly is a venture capitalist? So venture capitalist is an investor, which is the high, sort of almost the highest element of uh, finance. So that we will take greater risks um, than most uh, investors in return for higher um, ultimate potential uh, returns. So what I do is basically turn new scientific insights and what we call translate them. So turn those uh, new understanding about biological mechanisms or drivers of disease, turn those into drugs that we can then uh, treat patients whose diseases are being driven by that particular mechanism. So by doing that, we create value through developing patents and um, developing data sets, which can then be used for regulators and ultimately for partners to then do the, com to the continued uh, development and manufacturing and ultimate launch of the, of the product. Uh, how do you get into that business? You don't just kind of wake up one day and say, I'm going to become a venture capitalist, I assume. There must be things you have to do first or get people to invest in you. How, how does it start? Well, I started in the UK uh, before the, the biotech industry really existed in any material way. So I'm a biochemist um, uh, as undergrad uh, and worked in consulting and then went to do an MBA at, at Harvard. And as part of my story to apply to Harvard Business School, you have to tell them why um, HBS is the, the part of your life career plan. And my, my um, essay that I wrote was all about being placed in the heartland of the most vibrant biotech sector as it was and still is um, in the late 80s. And so I applied there in order to learn um, and be exposed to the biotech sector in the States because as part of studying biochemistry, it was an incredibly funky time. I mean, we were learning about, you know, key genetic changes and key um, drivers of disease and looking, this was right at the TPA and the early emergence of genetic engineering and use of biotechnology to develop new drugs. So for me, it was a, it was a brave new world and really exciting and we're best to learn it, but actually in the heartland of it. And so then when I got to Harvard, I then, managed to sweet talk my way into a intern job with what was then a startup with less than 30 people, which was Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Um, and that's actually a venture backed company. Um, and when I was studying, and I was able to spend time working with them as well as studying at, at business school. And so I could simultaneously learn about entrepreneurial finance, which is how do you actually build and fund these very risky loss making companies while actually sitting with a foot in the door where Vertex at that point was preparing to go public on the back of arm waves. I mean, it was blue, you know, really was blue smoke and mirrors at the time. Um, and what they were developing then, there's no relation to what the company looks like now. So for me, it was a fantastic experience to, to learn about how the industry works, to see 
science turning into actual mm -hmm. um, products and data. Um, and then and then the plan was was and which is what I did was to then come back to the UK um, and and try and get into the same sector here. So I joined Schroeder Ventures, which was a generalist uh, venture and, and private equity group. And actually shortly after joining, we then agreed to set up a dedicated life sciences team. Um, and two years later, we set up a dedicated life sciences fund and it basically went from there. Now, I wouldn't recruit me now because now I want people much more uh, experienced uh, than I was, but I got in so early that um, the term is I've been grandfathered in. <laughs> yeah, we have that term as well. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about one or two of the other things uh, that you're associated with, particularly dementia. But I guess we're better, you know, people are here to talk about vaccines, aren't they? That's why they've turned up. And so we better give them some vaccines. So you're, you, I assume you're already familiar then, as, as we go into COVID, with people like Patrick Valens and uh, the life sciences people in the UK. They're not strangers to you. Not at all. And so I knew Patrick well. Um, through his role at um, uh, head of R&D at, at GSK. And in fact, um, I, they, when GSK closed down their neuroscience business, um, we spun off and created two new companies uh, based out um, of, with people um, and know-how out of GSK. So no, I, I knew Patrick very well. Um, we did, we've set up one business in pain with um, NAV 1.7 um, channel inhibitors and one in uh, hearing loss and fragile X ALS. So, so I'd interacted a lot with GSK, and in fact, recruit regularly at GSK because they have high quality, uh, good people, um, and that you know, those are exactly the sorts of people I need in my companies. So, Patrick asked me to join his um, expert advisory group. Uh, uh, the email came through on the first of April, uh, and so that's when I joined that group and. And what Patrick had realized was that we needed to bring in greater industry and, and scientific and technical and clinical expertise um, into government to help um, think about vaccines and how best to protect the UK. Um, and then that developed over the course of April where we had a series of one hour meetings um, when it, I think, became clear that what was needed was a dedicated team led by an industrialist um, which was different from the normal way that, that government would run things, which would be within the officials and the civil service itself. Okay. Now, in your uh, you, your kind of presentation on, on this time, on the work of the task force, I'd just like to read you out the very first line of your very first uh, slide, which says, no vaccine has ever been successfully developed for any human coronavirus. That's your opening line. So when people started to sound you out, why did you, why did you even bother to return their calls? Why didn't you just change your number and go X directory? It was impossible. I absolutely thought it was a very, very challenging um, ask. Um, <laughs> and then it's been well reported that I was far from convinced that I was the right person to do it or, or whether I should take it up. Because the view certainly at the time and the first uh, expert advisory group meeting I asked um, the experts then what they thought the, the likelihood of success of finding and being able to develop a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I was told 15%, maybe 20, but 15 to 20% for those vaccines that were already in the clinic, of which there were maybe three. And if the, if the vaccines had not yet entered clinical trials, then it's probably 10% or less. So it was very clear to me that the experts and certainly people in my field, in the venture capital field, did not think that this was a shoe in anything like. I mean, I had people calling me up saying, you must be, you must be crazy. So this wasn't a, this was not a obvious uh, area that we were going to succeed. Um, and, and, but actually, you know, when, when you're asked and, and I came up with all the objections as to why uh, maybe this wasn't the right thing for me. They said, you know, we're asking you to, to step up at a time of a national pandemic. None of us have been through a pandemic before um, uh, and we'd like you to help. So actually, if someone asks you to help as bluntly as that, you say yes. Now, Andrew Harris has already picked up something that uh, I think you're going to elaborate on slightly, but the, the question he said is, uh, 
is the first lesson that you learn not to use civil servants. Now, that's very unfair to civil servants. Most of my best friends are civil servants. But nevertheless, when we were talking earlier, you did express reservations about how the, uh, the advisory committee would have coped with, with this task that you were first on. Yeah, I think an advisory committee is very different from a dedicated team uh, that, that is asked to um, deliver a set of objectives. So we were asked to do three things. One was secure access for the UK. The second was to make sure that any successful vaccine was actually available internationally and fairly distributed. And the third was to make sure that we were better prepared for the future. And the answer, um, Andrew, is that we could not have done it without the civil service. The, the real spectacular thing about the vaccine task force is we were able to take the best out of industry um, specialists and embed them with government experts. And so specifically, we brought on the industry side, we brought the vaccine selection, due diligence um, and procurement side. We brought manufacturing and scale up um, uh, expertise. And we brought all the sort of the industrial planning for how can we be better prepared in the future, as well as the clinical um, regulatory uh, skills. And then government side brought incredibly experienced uh, project management and project delivery. Again, of course, we relied heavily on the government's NIHR clinical trials, testing and regulation through with MHRA. Um, all the international work was done um, through Tim Colley, uh, who's exceptional, um, a former diplomat working with all his uh, counterparts around the world. Um, and the commercial negotiations um, is, is there for all to see because it's been actively dissected in the in the press and again it's been shown time and time again that the negotiations that were led um, by Maddie McTernan were absolutely world class and put the UK in a very strong position so I think it's the combination of both that worked so well neither side could have done it without the other. Okay so so you you get the call on was it May the 6th May the 7th something like that from uh, Matt and then from the Prime Minister and you're off so what's the first task? The first task um, for me was um, to actually understand the scope of what was being asked for. Um, and, and so actually even in the conversation I had with the Prime Minister was about the scale of the task and the expectation management, because this is not about buying PPE and um, you know, these commodity products and just making sure you get the right order in quickly enough. I was very, very anxious to make sure that the politicians really understood that this was a, an uphill struggle and we were going to highly likely to lose money, but that if we didn't make those risky investments in vaccines that we didn't yet know whether or not they would work, we could be sure that we wouldn't get any vaccines. So setting the expectations was probably my number one uh, goal, which I was like a broken record. So every single conversation I had was prefaced with, this is very difficult, we're gonna lose money, we have to make some risky bets. So the first thing I did obviously was to start putting the team together. And um, again, the, the government told me, um, we are giving you um, this gentleman, uh, Nick Elliott to come and work uh, with you, who will be your senior reporting owner or responsible owner. So he's basically the chief person within representing the government who is responsible for actually making sure that contracts are signed. So I can't, I don't sign anything. I don't have no spending authority. Is, is he the bomb disposal officer, by He's the way? He's the bomb disposal. So well, he should have it, good nerves. <laughs> exactly what you want. So someone yeah. with nerves yeah. of steel, nothing will ever rattle him. Huge <laughs> experience, very pragmatic. Um, this was chump change compared with what he'd been doing with, you know, defense procurement. Um, and so again, that was, so Nick and, and I were the, we were the first two to basically put together and he, we live almost next door to each other. So I showed up on my bike, he was in his running gear and we went for a walk around Queen's Park together and just mapped it out and said, you know, this is what we need to do. And so basically he went down the road of figuring out who were the key people he wanted to bring in um, from, uh, from the civil service side. And I went through on the industrial side to basically figure out those experts that I needed. Um, and that came together really well. And not surprisingly, we each worked, chose people that, with whom we'd worked before because we, the, the real message from the prime minister had been speed. 
and this is not about making getting perfect vaccines it was very much a a we need speed over perfection and you you know every day you take we will have more people dying so that that was really quite straightforward and so and so i've got the got the team in place within a you know week or two i mean really quite quickly and then within the actual vaccine diligence team we then needed to pull in a whole bunch of real specialists who could then uh, do the deep diligence on on the different vaccines to help us do the triage look at the funnels um, and then try and prioritize so the team was team was very critical which we ran in parallel with developing the strategy and then telling um really or really sharing what we thought we were going to be able to deliver and when um and i think that worked all quite well actually i mean i'm looking at, at the things you've been writing one of the early entries you had and i just want to read this out so people understand it it says loi to acquire veterinary plants and secure fill finish capacity now i've worked out loi's letter of intent i've no idea what the rest means but it's in something like week two now, i think this means you decided to buy a factory you know, as one does. Is that how it just worked? I mean, you just, you said, right, we need a factory, go and find one. One of the things we had to do, so if you think about getting vaccines to the UK, um, we're not going to be funding the underlying basic discovery work at this point. We were, so we were going to go to vaccines that were already uh, defined and in development. So in order to do that, there are two aspects of it. One is running the clinical trials to show they're safe and effective and can actually protect yep. people against serious disease. Definitely going to go on to that. Yep. And the second thing is we've got to manufacture them. So in terms of manufacturing, we didn't start with a, you know, the UK is not a country that has a big capacity advanced manufacturing, medicines manufacturing business. So clearly as part of pandemic planning, and preparedness, we needed to uh, increase the scale of the capacity for manufacture, scale up and manufacture. Um, but to do so quickly meant you're not building from, from scratch or you're not taking a brownfield site because you just don't have time to do that. So uh, explicitly, we were looking again at the shortest possible route to, to build up and scale up that capacity. Um, and this, the veterinary plant uh, in Braintree uh, was a was a very clever solution actually. So it, we bought it from a public company um, called Benchmark Holdings, um, and so while it wasn't obviously um, authorised for human vaccines, and clearly work had to be put in place to, mm. to get that level of quality and controls and and um, um, regulatory approvals, we were at least a long way down the road because the actual aspects of what they were manufacturing we're not a million miles away from what we were going to do. So yes, I mean, I, we, I remember I had a uh, conference call on a Saturday where we talked about what they wanted. We talked about what we wanted, um, figured out what the process of due diligence would be. And again, there was some, we, we, we didn't, this wasn't starting with a blank sheet of paper. There had been discussions, again, with, with key people, Andy Jones in um, uh, uh, Innovate and, and um, he had done a lot of work um, already. So what we did in, in, in most cases was to supercharge um, some of the things that have been there already. So we were able to, as you say, identify it, complete the diligence, shape out what we were willing to pay for it, um, and put a team on it that, that basically uh, then assessed the entire risk, cost, what needs to be done, what could be done, when we could start manufacturing, um, yeah. who needs to be recruited, all that sort of stuff. Now, there are around 200 vaccines that you're looking at. Is that a roughly right or something? Yeah. Was, yeah. I mean, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. And then, then, but then, but they're all, I mean, you say some of them have been around, but none of them have been around for longer than a few days, have they? I mean. No. So, <laughs> but, and so if the question is, well, how did you know which ones to pick? That um, was the question. Yes. <laughs> it was, again, not the question. Um, again, given the mandate. So the mandate was to get vaccines to the UK as soon as possible. So, of course, you have a, we had a filter, which was if the vaccines were not going to be able to be in clinical trials in 2020, they got cut they, or they were put into the, the next bucket for, you know, next generation vaccines. Um, so we had, a, we had a triage that basically looked at 
where were they in clinical development and was it realistic that we could get them uh, regulated and approved early? Could we be convinced that they could scale up such that they could not only manufacture population level scale, uh, scales, but also get those vaccines delivered or manufactured in the UK? So again, we didn't have a, a requirement that these vaccines had to be made in the UK. We just need to be convinced that they could be delivered to the UK. So it, the, the key um, early decision we made was, uh, was it BioNTech, um, who partnered with Pfizer, or did we go with Moderna, or did we do both? And if so, how do we do that? And based on the diligence, it was really clear that BioNTech was much more likely to be able to deliver us uh, substantial doses well before Moderna. And Moderna, not unreasonably, focused their... Uh, um, resources on building up and scaling up their US manufacturing ahead mm. of Europe um, and that's what our diligence revealed so we we had the, the manufacturing scale up and delivery as a um, as a key criteria and then of course we looked at what was the probability of success of these vaccines ultimately getting approved and clearly the most advanced vaccines which is the adenoviral vaccines and the mRNA vaccines had not been approved before by regulators so that we had no track record of how these vaccines perform, how durable the immune responses are, how safe they are, yet they were the most advanced vaccines. And so then we bookended our portfolio with the much less sexy vaccines, so that the protein antigen based vaccines and the inactivated whole viral based vaccines, which were slower to develop and behind in terms of clinical trials and, and going to come online at least six months later than the early vaccines. Right. We felt that those would be the bookends. So if the early hairy scary vaccines failed, we'd at least be able to default back to the sort of tried and tested, um, sort of well-known formats. So that's how, we, that's how we did it. And of course, then we added things like, did management, um, did they have a track record of, of launching vaccines? Did they understand what the regulatory requirements were for the UK and so on? So we had a long list of, of requirements that, that enabled us to, to triage down to about 20, I think. Um, and then we did do deep due diligence on probably, yeah, probably double what we ended up, more than double what we ended up um, prioritizing. Now, uh, Camilla Kalaka has asked a rather good question that uh, hadn't occurred to me, but is this normal in vaccine development? Did, 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 does venture capital get involved in vaccine development or was this completely terra nova? Um, it was news to me because I'd not done um, any prophylactic uh, investments before. Uh, right. Other VCs will have done uh, prophylactic um, vaccines. There was a company called Intercell, and so in Europe, and so there will be, and, and there were VCs, there's VCs invested in Valneva. But generally, it's not been a big area for venture capital investment, in part because um, you typically will have single government payers, so that will put a, a cap on pricing and um, you're not getting the same level of pricing as, as you would for, you know, life-saving cancer treatment. Um, and you've got to run very large trials with a very high safety threshold. Um, so actually, the sort of the risk reward is, is less attractive than going um, for diseases where you can literally save people's lives who are very sick, where, where the cost benefit and the and the potential value that you create for patients is is very material so so it's not been a big area of venture capital it's but, okay. but still the, the nature of what we do is the same so you're looking at preclinical data you're looking at the safety data you're looking at the clinical plans and the manufacturing and the regulatory path um, and so all all and you're that, you have a team that actually understands and can execute so it's all the different building blocks are the same even if the ultimate product is different Okay. Now then, how do you, what happens? Do they come, when they hear that, you know, the UK has got a task force, do they come and immediately start inviting out for dinner or getting the phone? Or do you go to them? How, how, how does, how's the connections made, particularly with the, as you said, the hairy, scary vaccines and <laughs> great word. Um, how, how does that work? Marlon Dial. So that we, we, for most cases, either had the mobile phone numbers of the key people in our uh, phones already, or we were one step away from it. So no, we absolutely went to them. And right. we recognized that this, the first thing we did was to ask JCBI, 
um, so the Joint Committee of Vaccination and, yep. and Immunization, so the vaccine experts advising the government, how many vaccines we should buy? Because again, that's not our call to say who should be vaccinated, that's the call of the experts. So we asked them and they said, even then, right way back, that their priority groups uh, were basically what ended up as the groups one through nine. So all adults over the age of 50, uh, plus all adults um, with severe underlying disease. So that, again, the numbers uh, of, of population is about 30 million um, for the UK. So that was, was the sort of the unit that we were, we were working for. And so actually, if you think about it, the UK, even, even if we've got a relationship, trying to get a, a vaccine company to pay attention to us, and we say, we, you know, we'd like vaccines for 30 million people, and then they've got the European Union that says we'd like vaccine for 450 million people. We were, we were very, very conscious that we were the little player and uh, could be a detraction. And so we, we very, very deliberately put together a strategy to say, what can we do to make ourselves attractive so that the vaccine companies will want to work with us and won't just disregard us as being a, a bit player. Um, and so that's where the whole manufacturing and clinical support um, really came to, came to its... Um, just, just elaborate that a bit, Kate. So I, I take the point completely. You've got the EU block, huge markets, etc. What was it that made us attractive? Because, you know, our stock in Europe isn't high at the moment. And, and as you said, we don't have a big manufacturing capacity. So what was it that made their eyes light up and say, no, we're going to go with the Brits? Oh, you know, to begin with, it's not either or. No, uh, true, and, true. Fair but, point. But again, with our mandate for speed, we were very keen to make sure we got to the front of the queue. Um, so the first thing we did was to say, we can help you um, develop, d deliver your clinical trials quickly. Now, again, we're not starting from a clean sheet of paper here. We have a very uh, well-funded, well-oiled national clinical trial network, um, which NHR run, and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So what we did was to basically say, well, what are the what are the bits that that are the slowest part of clinical trials? Clearly, getting regulatory approval is normally part of of the slowness of getting trials started. But in this case, the regulators and the ethics committees and everything. Uh, uh, all worked overnight and weekends and, and so the, the regulatory side was no longer a bottleneck. So then the next slowest part of clinical trials is physically recruiting the people into the trials. So that's why we then set up um, uh, this national citizen registry on the NHS website to en enable anybody in the UK sitting at home having a cup of tea to say what can we do to support the national uh, fight back against the pandemic and, and we gave them the opportunity to enroll on the website to express interest uh, to be contacted about clinical trials. So this was not enrolling in clinical trials, but at least giving consent to be contacted yeah. about clinical trials. And we set out to, um, to do two things. One is we wanted to ensure that the people that we recruited into that NHS registry would be reflective of those people most at risk from the infection. So mm -hmm. it had to be uh, include elderly, and mm -hmm. it had to include at least a representation of black, Asian, and minority ethnic populations who were disproportionately mm -hmm. affected. And where we ended up, and then the second aspect is it had to be big enough so that it would actually be meaningful to the vaccine companies. So we are now at uh, a shade under 500,000 people enrolled in that in the yep. NHS registry. I'm not aware that there's any other country that's got anything like this in the world. Um, and over a third are over 60s. So we did achieve um, at least the elderly uh, enrichment of that registry. We were much less successful with the, uh, the black um, and minority ethnic populations, mm. where we were about 8% versus a UK um, demographic of about 14%. So we worked really hard on it, but that's where we've, where we've ended up. And obviously that's also reflective in the take up of vaccines. Mm. So that was one thing. And, and by way of example, um, we, uh, we started and finished the biggest ever vaccine study, which was an Overvax phase three study then, um, of 15,000 volunteers um, before they even started the phase three study in the US. So just to give you a scale of how quickly that worked, it was fantastic. 
We oh. ran the, um, the Janssen, or running the Janssen study, the Valneva study, um, the AstraZeneca antibody study. So by being able to offer that, um, I think was pretty persuasive for some of these uh, companies. Um, yep. Also, if I can just divert a little bit, we've now got a basis for expanding that registry into not just volunteers for vaccine trials, but we did ask everyone who had signed up whether or not they'd be willing to be approached for other trials beyond COVID vaccines, and 94% said yes, they would. So what I think we now have, and it should be especially relevant to the audience here today, is a registry, at least the, bait, the, the core of a registry that are now allows us to start opening that up to patients. So it's my personal goal would be that anybody in the UK should be able to enrol in a registry, NHS registry, put in their clinical diagnosis and then immediately say, these are the trials that you could be eligible for um, as and when your doctors suggest that that's the right thing to do. So it's unquestionable that our ability to enrol and deliver those vaccines was a big attraction. Now that, that leads to thousands of questions really. Um, by the way, you're in, you're in the Novavax trial, aren't you? I am, and yeah. it's been, I've never been in the trial before. I, I, and it's, I mean, it's been fantastic. You know, you get okay. tested multiple times. Yep. Um, I've also now had my two shots of Novavax vaccine, so I'm fully protected, yep. which I'm delighted about. It's a um, very clever design, isn't it? And we, Claire Marks, who the, um, the chairman of the JNC and, and uh, Royal College of Surgeons, who was on, she, she's also in that as well. She told us live a few weeks ago. So, but, but Kate, this isn't a new idea. I, I, I've written a book on, on randomised controlled trials, and I hope 500,000 people will buy that. But, but it isn't. We, people have tried this before. People have tried registries. They've tried volunteers. And, but nothing has, nothing has got even close to what what you did um is it just because this was a national emergency and finally people get it or was there something else well i'm sure a national emergency was uh pretty helpful and <laughs> the good news is that um we were able to you know to explain that there will be no vaccines without clinical research you can't put vaccines you can't put anything into people legally uh, without um, it being approved by the regulator, the MHRA. So, um, so we, we, I don't know the detail of what's happened historically, but um, when we said we wanted to do this, uh, the advice that we had, which was perfectly reasonable from the Department of Health um, and NIHR, which is the, the, the group that runs clinical trials, is we needed separate um, expertise and resource to actually launch this registry because we needed to be able to tell people a it was there and b more importantly let people know what it meant why would people sign up to a registry they so they need to understand what the vaccines are whether they're safe how would they work why should they do it all of those things um and so the six hundred and seventy thousand pounds which has been so widely reported um, was actually um used to launch this registry and that meant you know daytime TV and regional radio interviews and going to some of the um, specific population interviews, going to different um, cohorts around the uh, country. So that's how, and, and speaking to community leaders and speaking to patient advocates, lots of different tools that we use to try and get to the different communities we needed to, so that we could raise the registry. So it may be that past efforts was less focused and didn't have the yeah. To do that, but it it has paid out. I mean, you're going over things very fast because I think that's how you work, basically. Uh, but I just want to just slow down for one second now, just to remind people that when when was it in November or something? You got a lot of stick from you know quite a lot of quarters on um, that you'd employed a boutique PR agency, which I think means small, doesn't it? Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I don't know quite what people thought you were doing with it to, to kind of. But just be clear, what, what, what was that money for? So the, the, the £670,000, which yep. uh, the number that's been banded around the press, yep. was used to launch this, the NHS registry. Now, uh, so it's not personal PR. Uh, and I have, as I said before, I've got no spending authority or contracting authority, nor should I. So all the actual um, contracts and spending, the, the I mean, crudely, big 
uh, decisions were made by the ministers. So the secretaries of state for health, business, treasury and cabinet office. Um, and then the smaller sort of operational contracting decisions are made by the civil service. So my, my goal was, or role was basically to set the strategy, put the team in place and then beat everyone over the head to make sure we did it. Okay. Um, and so the, the spending was basically to, to make sure the, 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 the registry happened. Because if you don't tell people about it, no one's going to sign up. And yeah. if people don't know what clinical trials are or why they are safe to, to join or how to join, they're not going to sign up. So there was an important uh, sort of public communications uh, message that needed to get out to tell, you know, the 70 year old lady sitting at home scared to death about whether or not she can even go to the shops, why actually she should enroll in the clinical trials and those are the people that we've had which has been again fantastic i know i'm just i'm just kicking myself you know to explain how clinical trials works you didn't buy half a million copies of my book which has only sold about 300. Uh, other people are pointing out seriously though that there have been similar things i mean someone's uh, john jewel's pointing out about biobank another success but even that didn't that i can promise you didn't take two two months to get going it took a lot longer but we have done things, some things at scale, that's true. Now, okay. It's somewhat different because that didn't have a sort of the same recall. No, no. Ability. So we needed to be able to bring people in. But yes, I mean, of course, the UK has been very good. We're not, I'm absolutely not suggesting we were doing this from a standing yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now let's talk, just talk a little bit about the money. Now you talked about, you know, you, you were gambling really, and that's what you do, isn't it, in venture capital? But if everything had turned into coloured water and none of them had worked, how much money would we have lost? Nine hundred million pounds. Okay, well that's straightforward. Okay, but, but that was part of the that was part of the yeah. plan. And and to, be, to say we're gambling suggests that uh, uh, you know, we're putting it all on black, and that was no, not the plan. I mean, we had very very detailed uh, due diligence uh, with real absolute crack team of experts went in and frankly they you know the calls they made were the right ones so i i think the, but you but you didn't know though i mean i don't of course i'm teasing you slightly but nevertheless i mean when you when you there must have been sleepless nights whilst you're waiting for the results of the trials there must have been. Well, if you think about it there's different stages so you've got the preclinical data yeah um where you you basically say what how how do these vaccines perform in different forms of animal and uh, we had non-human primate challenge studies. And again, you can see, and that was published in the Lancet um, for Oxford in, in July, I think, where they were yeah. able to show, maybe a bit earlier, they were able to show that they didn't get full protection against infection, but they had very significant uh, reduction in uh, severe disease um, and therefore turning something that could be a lethal disease back into a manageable disease. Janssen's non-human primate challenge showed complete protection against infection. So we had that sort of data that we could look at. We had um, all the safety data that had been um, done before. And then of course, um, from uh, July, we started getting the phase one, phase two data. So this was the immunogenicity data, which was basically saying when these vaccines were given to people, to volunteers, what was the immune response um, to those vaccines and we were able then to, to look at those and so while those were very encouraging what we didn't know is whether or not those immune responses were actually protective against either infection or severe disease um, so we had we had um, um, sort of stepping stones as we went along um, and the way we designed the contracts and work with the companies in most cases was these were staged financings according to you know achieving the different milestones. So although our overall aggregate um, contracts totaled a, a shade under four billion pounds, um, we, were only, we only had to pay that if, if the different um, steps were actually successfully achieved. And, and, and then we get to the bit, um, you, you know, the regulator bit uh, that comes along. And I think you also had in your uh, account of all this that, um, I, I, I've lost the quote now, but it was something about that. So no, no, 
no corona vaccine had been accepted yet had ever been accepted by a regulator etc cetera, etc cetera. and certainly no vaccine has ever been accepted in the speed that the regulatory system took but just to be clear you, i'm sure you're going to say this but the corners weren't weren't cut but they were taken at speed yeah. so well, first of all um, have to say the MHRA has played a complete blinder and has, has demonstrated, again, its complete robust professionalism care, um, but they've also torn up the, the rule book of how regulators work with companies, so, or anybody developing, in this case, vaccines. So what you or my previous experience was you go to the regulator, you say, this is what we'd like to do, we'd like your advice, and then the regulator comes back and says, gives you the advice. And what the MHRA did, led by um, June Rain, who was brilliant, mm -hmm. brilliant, um, is. basically say, um, no, we are now going to partner and work with the different vaccine companies to help them get to a, uh, a, a data set, a dossier, that we can um, actually go ahead and approve. So that share us your data as soon as you've got it so that we can start assessing that um, and giving you if there are key gaps or key things we need answers for, that we can do that as we go along. So it wasn't a matter of, of you know, don't give us your dossier until it's, um, until it's complete. It was give it to us as soon as you've got it. The tables can be empty, the figures won't have anything in them, but give us what you do have. And that made a huge difference because that, first of all, gives enormous confidence to both sides that they, they know what they're dealing with. Um, and second of all, uh, it, it um, is not setting uh, lines in the sand, which some of the other regulators said. So if you looked at the FDA, they had a very clear set of these are, these are the criteria um, below which we will not accept any vaccines mm -hmm. um, submissions. And so, for example, they said we will not accept vaccines with efficacy less than 50%, which is roughly what you get with a flu shot or yeah. on average. And that, again, before we knew where these vaccines were, was a bit alarming because the question was, if the vaccine was, say, 40% effective, would the regulators approve it or would they not if there was no alternative? And my personal view is the regulators probably would accept it if it was safe and they could show a 40% efficacy because 40% is better than zero. But, but, but the way the, the MHRA worked with the companies was very striking and I think bodes incredibly well for the future, which is point one. And then the second thing is what, what um, the MHRA, MHRA allowed, um, as other regulators did, was to then compress the clinical trials. So normally cash and, and funding and risk will determine how clinical trials are run. So you mm. first do your phase one and you assess this, the safety of the vaccine. Once you've shown it's safe, you then do your small sort of phase two studies to try and establish dose and to get an idea of what the level of efficacy is. And once you've got that established, then you go into your big um, registration phase three um, studies. Okay. And what um, we did in this case was to basically compress the phase two and phase three trials. So that once we have the early, the safety data, you could then go straight into those bigger studies, which saved a ton of time. Now, you wouldn't normally do that because you are, you're committing to run these huge big studies before you know whether or not you're seeing any efficacy in the, in the vaccine. And also before, um, um, you know, yes, I mean, before you know anything. So it was incredibly effective. And mm. it meant that without that, we would still be in clinical trials. And because of the compression, We've now got vaccines on the market, and um, I think it's billion doses. Yeah. Market. So, a couple of questions. One, one a good question actually. That, 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 that I think Ian Harvey's asking about the. Obviously, there's a there's a the the early it's, it's a business of the early press releases uh, against the rather more staid way in which we get things into the Lancet, New England Journal. Well, not me, but others do. Um, Someone said, "Was did that create some tension for you? The, the kind of the the different way in which uh, science presents data against a company having to, doing so for other reasons? Was there any problems with that, or were you comfortable with the way that worked?" You mean, you mean sort of announcements through press release? Yes, basically. Because, um, of course, um, the best way to to release clinical or any data 
is through peer reviewed journals where you have experts kicking the tires and really challenging, you know, supplementary figure two. And you know all of that, and having that properly done in the in the fullness of time. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But in the case of um, a global pandemic, actually getting the data out uh, and and public and shared, I think did in this case trump the the pure peer review. Um, and and so actually many companies have done a mixture of both. So they will mm. submit their. Um, manuscripts and say this has not yet been peer reviewed but here it is so that people can have a look at it and in due course we will publish this in a peer reviewed uh, journal and and allow proper scrutiny um, i don't think i've seen certainly for the leading candidates i don't think i've seen material changes from what was presented by press release versus what was um ultimately published um but i think i think it's a completely valid debate but i think the fact that it did come out again, was very good because I think by and large, the science journalists presented the data incredibly well. Um, and the fact that you've got, you know, front pages of the sun with, you know, statistical yes. headlines, I mean, actually is very striking and getting the whole concept of clinical research all in, in people's minds and risk benefit, that's, I think, incredibly good. And so I think the press release aspect of it worked very well. If these if this data was only ever released in, you know, the Lancet and New England Journal and so yeah. on, I think it would be less easy. And so, you know, the Science Media Centre did a great job in bringing together the journalists and the experts and providing that sort of detailed briefing where they really could answer the ask the questions and uh, uh, this kind of things. No, absolutely right. And, and there are a lot of journalists on this call, and I would draw attention to the way The Sun presented side effects. Uh, in a, in uh, on the front page, it's an absolutely superb infographic. I know we sometimes are a bit sniffy about them, but it's one of the best um, ever examples I've seen of getting over um, uh, how you present risks uh, to the public. So you know, well done. Okay, now um, oh, there's so many things to do. So I'm gonna, uh, we've had so many questions. Half of them actually just saying, "Well done, Kate." So that's good. But there are lots of others but as well. That, can I just interrupt? Sorry. You um, can. <laughs> just to say, it is not well done, me. It I, is well done to the whole team, and also well done to a highly, highly collaborative industry, volunteers, scientists, manufacturers. I mean, it's this. This is a been an astonishing team effort, and I, this is not a personal. No, call. it is very much a. Although, if you, um, when I watched the documentary Jabs, and uh, I have to say, your team did did definitely still say, "Well done, Kate." So I think we're still allowed to say that, and that was your team. Okay, now one one serious, two serious questions, and I want to change to, to a couple of other things. But for, firstly, um, let's be clear that there have been some who have said we could only do this because we had left the EU. That uh, without Brexit, we would be chained to some Brussels monster or something. How true is that? That's not true. Okay, so uh, last year we were still part of the EU. So we uh, were part of um, the European or invited to join the European procurement uh, process. Uh, and we looked hard at it. So, um, but we chose not to. And I've gone on record. I voted for Maine. So I did not go in with a uh, pre, you know, defined view of where and we were. Yeah. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, the way the commission uh, structured it was, and I understand this, so they didn't like the Brits, the Brits had opted out, but they made the conditions to us joining, uh, being part of it, quite onerous, so that we had to abandon everything uh, we'd done already, so the work with Oxford and AstraZeneca and the, the conversations that we'd already got started with the different vaccine companies. Uh, we would not have a seat at the table to negotiate or to be involved in procurement. Um, and we would have no influence over what vaccine we received and when. So that didn't make it a very difficult decision um, not to participate. But it wasn't that we didn't have the opportunity to participate because we did. Um, I do, though, in, in, the, in Europe's uh, defence, it is very difficult to get 27 countries to agree. And so, of course, it was easier for a single country like the UK to actually be able to be nimble, pick up the phone, have the conversation, meet again on a Saturday, scope out the deal by Monday, and put a term sheet together by the following week. That, that is not nearly as easy if you've got 28 or 27 countries to have to get aligned. Yeah. 
Uh, you, you make a very good point there. And that was the second question which you've answered. Now, now throughout this, you know, you've, you've given this marvelous story, but obviously politics is everywhere. But, and, and you told recently in an interview with uh, Die Welt that um, you said you don't understand politics. Now, you've been slightly tongue in cheek there, aren't you? You must have some pretty well-developed political instincts to have navigated so successfully um, what, what was an extraordinarily difficult situation. and I don't think I've got any political instincts. Uh, I'm not very interested <laughs> in politics. Uh, I, it's not really my bag. So I care a lot about how do you turn clever science into new drugs? That gets me very excited. And, but if you ask me about policies, about what you're doing with various things in government, I'm not a bit late to what I do. I will pay attention. But more broadly, I'm less... It's not something I spend lots of time doing. So I think the challenge um, uh, for me, or was partly how do, you, how do you actually work in the system? And actually, I think the fact that I was not experienced in politics was probably a benefit because it meant I didn't know what the rules were. And I just went ahead and said, this is how I think things should happen. Whereas if I was a bit more clued up and knew that, well, you never do it that way, I might not have suggested we'll do it that way because I would, I would already have, have blocked off um, ways of working because of, of thinking that that wasn't possible. So. The first thing we asked for was a um, ring fence budget so that we didn't have to fight over whose budget every contract we wanted to put in place would come out mm -hmm. of. And that was something that took some time and was clearly uh, pretty unusual, uh, but we got that through. And that didn't mean we could spend the budget, but it meant at least we weren't arguing over which pot it was coming out of. Um, and then we put together an investment committee effectively of, as I said, the four uh, secretaries of state. and. Um, that was highly unusual because normally you'd go from department to department and it would all be done sequentially and every set would be yep. and discussed and stuff. And we said, we don't have time for that. So that we will give you a very full, um, robust uh, proposal for what we recommend you do, complete with contract, complete with everything. And but we need a decision. And the decision can be no, or the decision can be uh, yes, but we want you to change X, Y, Z but we need a decision, we, we're not mucking around. And the fact is, again, the, the ministers play ball. And so um, we had plenty of uh, uh, committee meetings, eight o'clock on a Friday night, last thing that they want after, again, if you think about it, in the last autumn, this was a very, very tricky time. We were going into a big spike, um, all manner of challenges obviously going on politically, and we were being relentless and uh, not very forgiving in, in our need for speed. And that worked really well. So I don't think that's about political instincts. That's about just delivering on the mandate that we've been given. Fair enough. Now, we are going to run out of time. I think we'll, to those who are waiting for their glass of wine, et cetera, I think we'll be over by about five minutes because there's a couple of other things that I do want to to to. One, we have an awful lot of judges and, and uh, legal people joining on this. We don't know why, but we do attract them. And uh, the late John Mortimer QC wrote, of course, a very famous play called A Voyage Around His Father. I want to just spend a couple of minutes having a voyage around your father because I'm not sure that, that um, many of the... Uh, uh, of the people uh, tuning in will actually know who your father was. So tell us. Well, he has a, he has a lot of, uh, uh, or had a lot of legal bling. So he um, uh, started- Understatement off, of the year. <laughs> yeah, so he started off as um, Lord Chief Justice. So he's a, he was a barrister from the commercial court who then went into LCJ, which was unusual because uh, Lord Chief Justice is, is a, basically a criminal role, yep. which would normally have criminal uh, barristers or, or then barristers, now all lawyers, uh, um, taking that role. And then he moved, did I do that the wrong way around? Maybe he went to Master of the Roles first and then LCJ. I think it was that I think it was, so, yeah. So he went Master of the Roles first, then Lord Chief Justice, and then he went to um, be Senior Law Lord in the, at the point when the, House of, the, the Law Lords were still within the House of Lords. And so one of the key things he did then was to basically say uh, the law lords should not be part of the House of Lords. They should be in their own court and, and create a, effectively the UK Supreme Court. So that's he put the plans or helped drive the plans for that to be put in place, um, albeit um, 
had retired by the time that um, yeah. ultimately took place. And, and my he son. Was not in gold and his, you know, looked very good in dark black silk <laughs> and shiny shoes. And he was more than that as well. My son is now jumping up and down and uh, waving a book at me. Uh, he wrote one of the great books, um, The Rule of Law. Easy, short, um, but highly, massively influential about what the law is about and was a, a major player um, in changing the way we think about the law. So I just think really, and, and can I also say, your husband wrote the most amazing eulogy for him that I've ever read. And I just want to quote one thing from that because we're just, we're just going back to restaurants now, aren't we? And uh, I just want to quote that, he, 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 just tell me if this is true, but when he goes into restaurants, he would say, I think we can be happy here. Is that true? It was completely true. I mean, Dad was very uh, pragmatic and, uh, uh, I mean, wonderfully not austere. I mean, everyone thinks that judges are sort of removed from reality and, and uh, very otherworldly. Dad was the opposite. He drinks almost as much tea as I do. Um, and, and you're right, in how he writes, uh, he would write longhand, and if you looked at his judgment, uh, there would be no crossing, out, crossing outs. I mean, it's literally um, as if it was a pure manuscript written. I mean, it's astonishing, I couldn't do that. Um, and I think we will, we will put the eulogy written by your husband for his father-in-law, for your father, we send round after these uh, some kind of reading for people. And I do honestly, Read it, folks. It's brilliant. Absolutely beautiful. Last question, and then we're going to do some credits, but is this. Finally, a lot of people um, in my world who, who know you are all in the world of old age psychiatry and in dementia. So a lot of them are already clamoring to say, are you going to be able to do for dementia what you've done for COVID? Well, we're trying. Um, what we've, we've um, managed a fund called the Dementia Discovery Fund, yes. which is the first obviously dedicated fund to look for new mechanisms and new ways of treating and actually managing dementia rather than having not very good symptomatic treatments, you know, that work for some patients for some of the time. So there has been a very strong focus on the amyloid pathway and with lots of good reason, lots of good genetic um, linkages, but so far that hasn't led to any uh, drug that actually alters the course of the disease. Now we'll see where um, the FDA comes out on aducanumab, but still that's not a game changer, I think, as far as the data that's been shared so far. So what we're looking at is lots of different mechanisms that may be driving disease, much in the same way as if you go back 20 years, and I hate to say this in front of this erudite audience, but you know we used to talk about cancer by the organ. So you talk about you know breast cancer, colon cancer, um, liver cancer and now we don't we talk about her two positive we talk about triple negative we we look at the different drivers of, of disease and we look at different ways of actually both segmenting the patients and identifying which are the different patients and I had a very uh, direct um, role, uh, um, involvement through QDOS so a company we set up in Cambridge which ultimately which developed uh, Limpasa that or Alaparib so that was the first PARP inhibitor that works for people with a very specific genetic background. That was one of the few early sort of precision medicines where if you can stratify the patients, you can actually get much greater um, patient benefit than if you take an all comers. So what I, my goal is that we move dementia into that same um, understanding of stratifying patients, understanding the different drivers, drivers of disease. Now, it is a lot more complicated than uh, oncology. So there's no question that this is are going to cost more, take longer, and so on. So what we are doing is starting with some of the much smaller genetically driven dementias, so FTD and, and so on, and starting to see, can we demonstrate proof of mechanism in those patients? And then we can start broadening out to the broader dementias. But we're looking at all sorts of, whether it's mitochondrial defects or um, senescence or um, synaptic physiology, looking at all sorts of different mechanisms that may autophagy may play different roles in in uh, the drivers of different forms of dementia this is fabulous now kate don't go 
I've got to do a couple of announcements, but I want you to stay and I want the audience to stay because uh, we've got something quite spectacular to end with. But, but first of all, can I just remind everyone, this is sponsored by the Royal Society of Medicine and uh, we've had a tricky few months and a, a, a years as well. So do please, uh, if you uh, wish to donate to us, do please do that. Uh, we'll start at 900 million. That seems to be about a reasonable uh, donation. Um, now, tomorrow lunchtime, um, we're now going to be talking about all the pandemic in places that we don't talk about very much. So it'll be prisons, immigration centres and so on. And we'll be welcoming Kate Davis, Emma Moore and uh, Ika Anya for that. And in conversation next week will be me again and neuropsychiatrist Tony David and his new book, Into the Abyss, Journey of Brain and Mind. So do come back for that as well. Now, Kate, um, I, I just want to, I mean, you... You, you know, you, you were already successful in your career. You were well-known and respected in life sciences, but now you're something else. You're famous. You're the 18th in the world. And I do feel sorry for the other 17 if I were them, because it is something incredible that you've done. And could we just have the last or the only slide, please? The only visual aid we have, which I've taken from your report. And here we are. Now, just tell us what this is. So what this shows is the time taken from the identification of a particular pathogen to the point at which there is a vaccine approved for those, uh, that particular pathogen. And um, if you look at all but the SARS-CoV-2, you can see that these are very material times um, that are typically taken to develop new, new um, vaccines. And so when, again, we were facing, uh, I don't think this is necessarily complete, but um, when we were facing the, the prospect of finding a, a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, again, the prevailing wisdom is this could, would take years. And we knew that years was not going to be possible. I don't think you can put the, the world in lockdown for years. And so when actually this it showed that, you know, in early January, we had the sequence from Wuhan, and by uh, December the 2nd was the first Western approval of uh, a vaccine that was a world's first and just astonishing. I mean, this is the best, most astonishing slide in the world, I think. I think, I think you can get away with that. I really do. So lots of people are saying, well done. Lots of other questions we're never going to get round to. So I think we can all say, you know, well done. We're glad we have the task force. And I'm quite convinced that it was a fantastic decision to put you in charge. Well done. Thank you from everyone. And, um, Everybody, good night. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure you did. There'd be something wrong with you if you didn't enjoy that. Kate, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much for having okay. me. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure.